Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, May 4th, and may the 4th be with you. <laughs> 2023, this is the week and charts. I just want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. All right, we're going to talk about. Well, obviously, current market conditions and your questions on trading, your favorite stock and crypto picks. Hold off on your crypto and stock picks until we get to the live charts. We'll do crypto first. There's not a whole lot happening there. It's crazy. It's a, there's nothing happening. Then it's like uh, everything's going all at once. There's a lot of updating I want to do this week and catch up. Uh, for instance, I want to talk a little bit about using the core methodology of crypto. And last week I had three or four that all hit the IPT which sort of dovetails in for the rest of uh, tonight's presentation, at least quite a bit of it. And we only have one left, so I'll show you that one and the thinking there. But it's the same thinking that goes into the core trend trading. Money management, that sounds good on paper. I was supposed to get to that last week and didn't get, uh, didn't get wasn't able to get to it, but we'll get to that this week, I promise. And then I want to do a little bit of an update on the ODT, zero DTE options. Are they too good to be true? And probably, but I've done okay so far. Not enough to brag about just yet. And there's been a lot of grinding it out that I found out about so far. And I'll flesh out as much as possible on that. And as I'm learning, I'll, I'll let you know. One thing I didn't want to, I did want to mention last week about the TFM 10% system is that we did have a low level signal. Let me turn this on. And sometimes the low level signals can lead to a whipsaw. They get you in early, but they can also lead to whipsaw. Now, that'll make sense in a second too. This is Claims Green, as you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff could have between now and then. That's from my buddy, Greg Morris. All right, so last week I talked about how markets are markets, and I've been using the core methodology lately in crypto. Now, sometimes when the markets are really going, and as I often say, we go from 1999 to 2000, and then back to 1999 again in crypto. Everything seems to take off, and then the markets just all kind of kind of implode or chop sideways, and then they, then they take off again. So it's kind of cool. You have to stay on your toes, though. You have to continue to do your analysis every day, whether or not it brings anything or whether or not you can set up from Kind of like the core methodology lately. It's been a lot of work and not much to show for the efforts. Anyway, so last week, and I'm not doing huge trades here. And you can see there's the trades down here. Got in at 2222 or zero. 0.02222 and then flipped out half at 20%. So we had nice Landry light, we had a little bit of a pullback here, kind of a shallow pullback. In crypto, where the market like this is really running, I'm not gonna split hairs and look for the ideal perfect setup like I have been doing quite a bit in stocks because lately at least, because the market just really hasn't been fantastic. So if you're newer to trading, I'd suggest something like a Landry light pullback and these, and I think that you do fairly well with just that. But anyway, fairly shallow pullback. Entry was here, 20% IPT was here. And then last week I wrote the next big thing, question mark. And the stop has been brought to break even, which is the same as the entry. So I'm free rolling on this one. And I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully we'll be with it for a long, long time. So it hasn't really turned into the next big thing just yet, but I am free rolling. And one of the underlying themes tonight is that free rolling is the secret to success. That means taking those partial profits out, getting that stop to break even or better, and then trailing that stop higher over time. Now, getting back to the zero DTE options, they are... They are kind of cool, and I'm trying to. Th I was trying to find a, a a name for a white elephant or something that seems too good to be true, and I haven't come up with that just yet. Now, one thing I did learn is they're stupid expensive on sped on Fed days because I was thinking, hey, what if I came in and put in some kind of strangle or something, which I'll mention a little bit in in just a second. But what if I put a strangle, meaning buy some puts and buy some calls? 
and then put two time orders in and then try to catch possibly both sides of the market. And I got my answer pretty quickly when I got to my office, pulled up my screens. And once the market opened, the options were trading and the HVs closing in on 60. And what's interesting is after the Fed announcement, I'm sorry, the IVs, the IVs shot up to like 75 and 77. They were just absolutely ridiculous. So implied volatilities can get really, really high on these things. Now, last week I, I talked a little bit about one of my strategies and it's something I really hadn't fleshed out other than watch the market. And if you have like a big race to the finish, meaning that it just kind of goes straight in one direction, kind of on a route. And that only happens in the last 10 minutes a day, maybe even the last five minutes and sometimes the last two minutes or one minute thing. And it's kind of a, I hate to use the word scalping strategy because I'm not a huge scalper, but it's kind of like a scalping type of strategy. And I found out really quickly that you can't do it in e-mini options because you can't buy them. You can only buy them about 15 minutes before the close. Anything later than 15 minutes or closer to the close in 15 minutes, you can't buy the options, at least from my experience. But I did put on some puts on the XSP the other day, as mentioned in last week of charts, and just let them expire without touching them just to see what would happen. I did this late today, more for an experiment than an actual trade but i did get debited the difference between 417 and 479 so whatever the, that difference was times three was 60 something dollars or whatever did get debited to my account so i did confirm that they're cash settled i mean i read that they're cash settled but i wanted to actually see for myself it's other like the e-minis if you're long let's say you're long well this is a good case right here let's say you're you're short at 4100 or you have puts at 4100 and the market closes below 4100 you're profitable but you're going to get delivered some short e-minis okay uh same thing goes for stock if you're in the money on a stock this cash settlement is really cool because you you don't have to worry about shutting all this stuff down at the end of the day especially if it's if it's in the money or near the money and getting ready to go into the money and that could be really tough if you got on 10 or 20 option positions, maybe not 20, but let's just say you have, have on 10. Let's say it's a Friday weekly expiration and you're doing a bunch of different stuff and you've got on 10 positions. Well, it's a lot of trouble to go in and shut those down and try to get a little premium out of whatever's left out. But if you're in the money a little bit or at the money or just out of the money, just let the chips fall where they may and see what happens. In the past, what I what I do, and I probably still will do this sometimes, especially something like uh, Lab D, Lab U, and Sox L, Sox S, is I'll actually exercise and then put in a trailing stop or a market on close order after I exercise. Now, just like any other thing, you you really should look to free roll with these. At least that's my strategy for now. If I could get twice what I paid for an option, now obviously you got to go out the money a little bit on that and what i'm looking for is a gamma play gamma is ready to change the delta and that all changes really really quickly because you've got an out of money option that's not worth much all of a sudden it doubles in value and that's uh what the option players call gamma get you because you don't want to sell gamma because it's a very 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 dangerous thing to do anyway with slightly out of the money options you can put in an ipt at 2x and, and maybe a little bit further out of the money too you can put an IPT at 2X for half of the position for a free roll, and sometimes noise alone pays for your position. For instance, options five points out of the money trading at 50 cents, and the market rallies four points, the option jumps to a buck or more. So like I said last week, let's say, and I was using e as an example, but I've been using XSP quite a bit lately. But let's say you buy those 435, 40, 35 calls, okay, you pay two bucks for them, and then the market begins to rally. Well, all of a sudden, they're worth four bucks, okay? They're not worth anything at expiration, which I'm going to beat the dead horse on in just one second, but you don't care about that, okay? Only care about getting your two times off, okay? So you get your, your money back, 
and then you got a free position. You're free rolling on the option. You doubled your money, but then you leave half on. And then if you get a, a large move, directional move, then you're positioned for that directional move. Now, sometimes on a choppy day, on noise alone, you could end up getting some free positions. And there was a, I'll talk a little bit about today in a minute. But there was a day a while back, when we look at the charts, I'll, I should be able to pick it out, but it was really narrow range bar and it was really, the market hardly did anything. And I was able to get two or three free roll positions. Now, at the end of the day, I didn't really make any money on that narrow range bar, but if I'd have tried to trade outrights on a day like that, I probably would have lost money. So again, sometimes the noise alone can, can generate free rolls now i haven't done a tremendous amount of money management other than letting them go to zero because a lot of the options i'm buying are, are out of the money a little bit and those are expensive options to buy i realize that but it doesn't matter how expensive they are as long as they become more expensive right after you buy them now here's today's action and we had the gap lower, and then it looked like it was going to be pretty much a route lower. And I was looking at puts thinking, okay, we got a gap and go situation. And those options were just ridiculously expensive. You would have to pay a ton of money for these things, and they the chances of them being worth anything or, or were next to nothing. But as the day wore on a little bit and the market chopped back and forth, I ended up with seven option positions on both sides of the market and i was thinking that well maybe we have the mother of all reversals opening gap reversal and i was also thinking that if that opening gap reversal stalled out we just have a retrace and the market would roll back over and take out its lows and it really didn't do neither of those or either of those things but i was able to get five out of seven positions to turn into free rolls okay so all these options were worth twice as much as what I paid for them. Unfortunately, and I guess the bottom line is the bottom line, I ended up losing money overall. <laughs> Excuse me. Ah. But it wasn't much, okay? Um, had I trade, traded the underlying E-minis or TQQQ, SQQQ, and SPXL, SPXS, or all that other stuff, I probably would have lost a lot of money on a day like today, and it was it was kind of negligible. So I know you can't live off hypotheticals, but had this market cracked or had the mother of all open gap reversals, went back in black, those positions that I ended up with could have really paid off. So still working on this, this is a work in progress, I do think there's promise. I think you have to be careful. And keep in mind, I'm just doing really small size right now while I'm trying to figure it out. And a lot of my positions, so to speak, are, are very small, like 30 or 50 or 60 bucks in a lot of these positions. Not a tremendous amount of money is being put up. Now, a couple of things. Sometimes you might have to fade the market a little bit with these things. You definitely, with all options, you really have to anticipate the movements a little bit more. So that's the problem with options is you 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 really have to anticipate the move if you're gonna to try to catch that gamma play because otherwise by the time the move begins to happen, it becomes too late. So a very complex way to trade. I don't wanna make this sound easier than it is because it, it, it does have some issues. Uh, again, the free rolling has been pretty cool, although it hadn't paid, the only day it paid off was a couple of days ago when they had that kind of that route lower. It worked out pretty good. Now, if you're buying them, and I would strongly urge you not to sell them, unless you're an engineering type, I wouldn't get into the complexity of, of butterflies and iron condors and all that other crazy stuff. I'm just kind of position trading here, looking to capture an expansion in volatility. So when you do buy options, purchase options, remember, and never forget, I should say, your long volatility. So if the volatility comes off the market, the option prices are gonna come down in price too. And if you're long, you're gonna obviously lose money, at least, unless you get somewhat of a directional move. Now, one thing we've been talking about lately, and one of you guys brought it up, I think it was Turk, 
they're expensive in the morning and cheap or at least cheaper in the afternoon and i guess my feeling with these things is that a lot of times the price of them even though the option models might show them as expensive a lot of times i'm and i'm going to get into this in just one second but a lot of times i'll eyeball a chart and say you know what this thing looks like it's getting ready to break out it could e easily break two or three points and these options seem to be really really cheap and this is where you got to be careful you don't want to you don't want to load the boat because they could expire worthless obviously but you might be able to say you know what i think it's worth a shot i'll pick up a few of these options and then i'll flip out half of them should the market take off and then you you just put that order in ahead of time because these things if you watch them sometimes they'll have these crazy jumps and you might be the only one there on the offer and somebody needs to get in or out or whatever the case is really quickly and you might get a, a crazy offer fill in fact i was kind of amazed today but computer was zinging and i'm like what's that and it's like to my surprise a lot of these options were hitting 2x now I'm kind of working on strategies now. I, I think uh, just a general tape reading can help. And sometimes you get a market that maybe like a fake out after a fake out, maybe like today, let's say the market gaps low and starts selling off and then tries to reverse, maybe sells off one more time. And then the third time's a charm where it actually does begin to, to really take off in earnest. Or if you're watching and watching a breakout, make sure it sticks and it comes right back in. Maybe the second breakout or the breakout through the bottom of the range might be a, a way to play it. Um, again, I think you you kind of have to, in some cases, you might have to fade the market a little bit. And there's a big danger in that. There's an ego in that too, being that contrarian type of trading. Uh, at the least, you do need to anticipate them. And I would encourage you to do directional plays and not just buy way out of the money options because the market is is cheap. Now, if you're... Let me talk out of both sides of my mouth. Like today, we had a potential opening gap reversal because the market kind of found its low and the market begins to rally a little bit off its lows. Maybe anticipate that opening gap reversal a little bit. Maybe anticipate the market going back in black and then try to figure out how to get some cheap options where you can profit should you go back in black. But don't go crazy just because the options are, are cheap money wise. Don't buy a shit ton of them. Um, as I said a second ago, possible race to the finish where you're buying options late in the day and you're letting them expire. It could be a bit of a crapshoot, but sometimes it sets up just right. The problem is, is when it doesn't work, it doesn't work, obviously. Opening gap reversals, obviously, there's possibly, there's a possibility to, to maybe leg in the strangles. And this is somewhere you got to be careful because now you're, now you're spending two times the commission are and and two times the premium is what i wanted to say but two times the commission too so a strangle a straddle you'd buy a chew at the money and that's incredibly expensive and then if you if you try to get a strangle you could buy one that's out of the money and 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 one on the other side a put on the other side that's a little out of the money uh buying them outright so far doesn't seem like it's that cheap although i've been watching like a 25 cent strangle in the xsp and it's like seven or eight points at the beginning of the day and then as the day goes on that gets narrower and narrower so maybe there's a sweet spot where it gets within so many points of the current price to where that might be worthwhile i would prefer to play a directional play but let's say the market gets really frothy and you're playing that directional play and you're making really good money and you're taking profits and, and you're getting your free rolls and all that other stuff. As the market rallies and rallies and rallies, you know you're gonna get a correction at some point in time, maybe put on a few puts to kind of leg into that strangle a little bit. But obviously, as I'm talking, I just, I just remind myself here of, of how many potential dangers there are getting more complicated letting your ego take over um having anticipate the market having to anticipate the market could create the as dakota says intuition versus the intuition so there's a lot of issues with these things but to my surprise a lot of times so far at least knock on wood a lot of times i've had modest losses because even on choppy days like i just said well, a few times that the noise alone has given me the free rolls. Now, with any option, 
you could use an option prices model, of course. Everybody in the brother has that. I'm not sure what edge that gives you. The only edge I know know of that ever gave to anyone was someone who had a model before anybody else did, and they actually sold it to a brokerage and they told the brokerage to go easy on it. <laughs> and this was long before everybody had the model. And uh he claims that that was a billion dollar mistake. I do know of one option trader that made uh like 80 million, but that was back in the day when uh it was Tony Saliba. And uh, I asked him, he could he said he you couldn't do it in today's markets, obviously, but he said back then it was like being a land of the blind with in only having one eye. So yeah, way back in the day, if you had some kind of model that nobody else did and you know how to price these things, then then absolutely. But nowadays everybody has the same model. So I'm not sure what that what that gives you. So again, my question is when I'm looking at any option stocks or commodities or whatever or um, indices, can the underlying move far enough between now and expiration to make buying it worthwhile? Now, by far enough, it doesn't necessarily have to go in the money. Like I said earlier, you could buy a slightly out of the money or even way out of the money option, and that could easily double in price. And that's why you don't want to short those things, even though it might be tempting. So that's the type of move you need. Now, always think in terms of at expiration and say, well, can this stock or can this index move far enough into the money to make this thing worthwhile? Always ask yourself that, of course, but then also ask yourself, could it move far enough for me to possibly get a 2X on my option premium just on noise alone? Now, IV might help on a relative basis, and I'm starting to watch IV. That's implied volatility. And implied volatility, let's say you've got a, a market that has an HV of 20, historical volatility. So that's statistical volatility. It's a mathematical equation. And basically it says, it's a lot of statistics involved, and we know the market doesn't adhere to statistics. But it does give you a good representation, a good standardized measurement. So, and, and don't quote me on this if you're a statistician, because maybe I'm don't don't uh don't beat me up on this if I'm saying it wrong. But basically, if you're looking at all the statistics and a market is an HV of let's say 20, there's a two-thirds percent chance it's going to be 20% higher or 20% lower a year from now. Now that's not the great thing about HV. The great thing about HV is I can look at a sleepy food company and then I can look at a biotech and I can see the food company might have an HV of 20, the biotech might have an HV of 80. Well, I know that biotech companies gonna be a lot more volatile and that's a stock that, I'm, that as a general statement, I wanna go after the more volatile stocks within reason because sometimes it gets too crazy. But getting back to the implied volatility, it's what the option is implying, okay? So the options were implying a 75% move annualized on the on the S&P 500, which would be kind of crazy one way or the other. So I think HV, or I'm sorry, IV might kind of alert you to the fact that these things are crazy expensive. But the bottom line is always look at the the price of the option and always look at how far the underlying would have to move to make buying an option worthwhile. Now, one of you guys was saying that you throw in a bunch of crazy orders and you've been getting hit on them, like going below the bid or something or at the bid if it's really wide. I've experimented with that a little bit and I've actually gotten a few orders off. The only danger, and it happened to me once today, was like you end up like a, Let's say you're bidding six cents for an option. Let's say it's a six eight or something. So you're like, all right, I'll go in at six. And then all of a sudden it's seven eight. And so you bid seven, then it's seven nine, and then you then you bid eight, and then now it's nine ten. And it just kind of starts slowly getting away from you or quickly getting away from you. So that's one of the dangers in that. And if you get your timing right, the market should be moving to where you're actually paying up for that option as opposed to getting it at a bargain. All right. Any I I know. Options are complex, and and hopefully, hopefully as the weeks go on, I'll be able to give more and more 
ideas and thoughts on uh, on exactly how to how to do this stuff. But if you're if you've traded indices before, then take a look at those options and and see if there's there's something there. And I would say for the most part, I don't think you could do it like like this morning. I actually had to go long the underline because the options were so expensive or short, whatever the case may be. I think it was short. But always look at those options and see if there's a, a chance that you could use those as a substitution for the underlying, because one, your losses are limited and in choppy markets like indices, you could lose a lot of money really fast. And then of course, as soon as you get out, the market turns right back around. Not that you want that let it go to zero be a strategy, but that's one luxury you have with the options. And like I said, last week, a friend of mine lost a few hundred dollars trading index shares. And I know he's he's not doing big size. So I'm wondering if he were to learn the options, could he have risked maybe half of that amount and then possibly even ended up with a free roll or something? So I think there's something there. I think it's it's kind of a, a, a dangerous thing. And I think it does sound too good to be true, be true and it can be. The the positives again that I that I came I walked away with last week is um sometimes noise alone can can get you some nice free positions. And then of course you need the market to actually make a move to make money on them. But again, the noise alone could 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 get you out of half of those positions and give you free positions that allow you to free roll. And I think that's I think that's a pretty big deal. All right, uh, no questions on that? Okay, let's move on. Uh, what I meant to meant to talk about last week and I didn't get around to it is that this signal for the TFM 10% system and the signal is uh, two bars, two lows greater than 50 day moving average for the buys and a close above the buy line, which is 90% of the 50 week closing high. Now, this was the closing high, which was the last day of 2022. Ironically, that, that was the all time high for the S&P 500. And notice that this line didn't drop much or didn't drop at all, obviously, until at least 50 weeks. And then it starts, like then it becomes this level here, minus 10%, this level here, minus 10%. And then it, each high, it, each 50 week high subsequent to that. So it takes a while for this to catch up to price. And that's something that I didn't really plan into the system, but it was kind of like a neat feature. And if you get a whipsaw filter, a whipsaw in the market, not a filter, but a whipsaw in the market, sometimes it could get you right back in at a higher level. But these low level signals, you might get one or two buys and the market really hasn't picked up a lot of steam. So you, you be prepared to be stopped out maybe in your first probe, so to speak, if you're trading a system like this, a longer term trend following system. And it might be a little early when the when the line finally comes down to catch up with the actual market because you might not have a tremendous amount of momentum, but the system can kind of give you this little stealthy type of signal like, hey, market is improving. We're back above that 50 week simple moving average. We got Landry lights and we're within 10% of the old highs. It doesn't look and feel like it right now though. Isn't that kind of a weird thing? And, and the, the doom and the gloom, and you can cut it with a knife. It's so bad. But sometimes that's when you have your best rallies when, when, the, when the market and the news is just absolutely horrible. The market shrugs it off and looks ahead. I mean, when, when it looked like we're gonna all die from COVID, what did the market do? It bottomed out, it went straight back up. Anyway, a close above the buy line or within 10% of the 50 week closing high, two bars of Landry light. The sell side, just real quick, simple, 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 a close below the buy line, which is 10% or more away from the 50 week moving average and a close below the 50 week moving average. That's it. So sell signals or a little less stringent. Hey, if you're watching this on YouTube, like it. And if you don't like it, go have no fun no fun somewhere else <laughs> subscribe to the channel channel while you're there my youtube is at dave landry and become a gold member of davelander.com and uh, become a, a service member too while you're at it 
And with the service, you get a daily service for me. And you can see the archives to that at DaveLander.com slash archives if you want to look at all those. But with the gold membership, you get uh, trading courses and preview courses are unlocked over time. And then I'm, uh, as I was saying earlier today, you guys, if I don't respond to everything, it doesn't mean that I haven't read it. So I, I do lurk all day in Facebook. We got a good group of traders. Facebook is free, but you do have to be at least a gold member of my website. All right. Speaking of Facebook, I solicited every week I solicit questions for this presentation. And this is one that Brian asked. Some methodologies move the stop to break even at one time's risk, but don't take half profits until two times the risk is, is achieved. Have you modeled this? And I said I modeled everything. I've tried everything on the sun. The I think it'd be easier to to kind of back into this answer by talking a little bit about my money management and also I've given away all my books, not all my books, but I've, I've, I've kept the ones that are rel relative, relevant to me when it comes to trading. And I'm pretty sure I gave away the book that Brian was talking about. So if you could find that in the book, and I don't want to beat him up just in case it's something that um, I want to make it look like I don't believe in what he's what he's saying. But if you could find the book, let me know. So we'll make sure we're looking at the same thing. But anyway, uh, let me talk a little bit about my money management, and then let's kind of work into two times 2x or two risk for the initial profit target anyway so let's say we got a little generic pullback tfm stuff okay we're going to enter at the red line and we're going to stop out at i'm sorry we're going to enter the green line and stop out at the red line okay so obviously if you take the entry minus the stop and those are the only two numbers you have to determine, by the way, when you're trading a stop, a stock is where you're going to enter and you want to enter above the market to make sure you don't get triggered on noise alone, right? And then your, your stop needs to be far enough away outside of normal noise. And again, there's a lot of ways to determine the stop that we talked about quite a bit. Look at my YouTube channel for that or go through the money management course at the back of the website. But the bottom line is, answer one question. It's kind of like those options, right? Answer one question. Where, as a trend follower, would I be obviously wrong? Okay, let's say you're trading a, a first pullback after a base breakout, and you trigger in, and then the stock goes back into the, break, the base. Well, you're wrong. So your stop needs to be somewhere inside that base, okay? You don't want to let it take out the complete base and have it you know, way down at some ridiculously low level if you're newer to trading by the way err on having your stops a little too wide that way you'll catch you'll catch more winners while your stock picking improves now as you get better and better with your stock picking then you can cinch up your stops a little bit you might have a pattern like a wide range bar tko where your stop is defined and you put it at the bottom of the bar and then your entry is right above the top of the bar so all that's defined you can trade it in a textbook type of manner but anyway, before I digress too far, so that's our risk, okay? So let's say our risk is 1R. Well, if we broadcast that up, we automatically have our IPT. By the way, if you're a member of DaveLander.com, just go to Members Resources and you can download a spreadsheet there, which if you put in your entry and your stop, it's going to calculate the number of shares and then your initial profit target and everything else. So when that initial profit target is hit, we take off half of the position at 1R, okay? And we'll get to the 2R and all of this stuff in a minute. And our stop is immediately brought up to break even. Now, we do trail a stop as the position moves in our favor. And then if it hits intraday, we jump that stop intraday. We never move a stop intraday unless the IPT is hit. Then we bring it all the way to break even, okay? So we, ch we only change stops nightly. Each night, I look at the stock or whatever. If it's making new highs, then we bump the stop up a little bit, okay? If it didn't do anything, we'll leave the stop where it is. But when you hit the IPT, you bring it up immediately. Now, I did have a client that 
would not move his stop. And we're going to talk about the two R thing in just one second. But he didn't move his stop until the initial profit target was hit. There's a, a 4X account. I think it's, I think my 4X account is locked up. I haven't used it in so long. But if memory serves, at least through one platform, that's how the trailing stops work there. They don't trail on a one for one basis until or unless the initial whatever that stop was distance happened so if it's 50 pips or whatever then the market would have to rally 50 pips before that stop kicked in so we're not trailing the stop intraday okay unless of course you hit that ipt and you're trying to squeeze a little bit more out of it before taking those initial profit targets off that's one way to kind of tweak the methodology a little bit and not that we're looking to beat the methodology, but kind of improve upon it. It's like, okay, well, market, let's say we got, uh, we're looking for five points and the market gaps open, we got seven points and then it looks like it's gonna keep on going. And we got eight points, nine points. Well, we might put in like a two point trailing stop at some point during the day and squeeze out seven or eight or nine points when we're only looking for five. So that might be a case where you use an automated trailing stop. But in general, just a, the general management of a position, we don't, move the stops intraday unless the IPT is hit. Now, three things will happen with this form of money management. And by the way, not enough time to get into tonight, but I've been asked before, is my money management psychological or statistical? And the answer is yes. The psychological part of it, two things. One, you get that, that Maslow's it's the gratification that we're all so used to if the position moves in your favor and you hit that IPT. And then two, you go a little further up that ladder. I know freshman psychology reared its ugly head, but you get a little further up that ladder in self-actualization when you ride out that longer term trend. And also monetarily, that's where the money is. But anyway, a couple things could happen. You get stopped out for either your full risk or maybe a little bit less, like in this case where the stop trailed up a little bit. The second thing can happen is what I call the better than a poke in the eye trade. And I just did three or four of these in crypto and, and I just haven't had a trade in the last week or so. Can't find a trade in crypto to save my life, but that's okay. I'm riding out one and we'll see what happens. We'll see if it turns into the next Bitcoin. <laughs> Bitcoin, <laughs> doubt it, but you know, who knows? All right, so in a case like this, you only end up making one half R which I realize is a little dangerous if you're reading all these mechanical system books. They're going to tell you you want 3R or 4R and all this other stuff. But keep in mind that that's not our ultimate goal. Our ultimate goal is to get that initial profit target, get that stop up to break even, and then trail it and let it widen out over time. And then hopefully ride the trend out for a long, long time. I know one of you guys recently asked me about how do you trail the stops? If you look on the back end of the website on the money management module, there's two things. There's keep the change where the stock, let's say the stock goes up 10 cents. You don't bump your stop up 10 cents unless it's a cheap stock, of course. You just leave it where it is. So that kind of lets it gradually open up. And then the other one I call gaining ground. Let's say the stock jumps three points in one day. You might only bring your stop up two points, thereby letting that stop widen out. Lots of examples on that, so I don't want to get into too, too many details on that, but you get the idea. Now, this is where this is where the magic happens, and I know the magic hasn't happened lately. We're just one setup away from making all this stuff work again, right? This choppy market we've been in, nothing seems to work. And it made me, pretty, made me feel pretty good. Uh, I got clocked and I know some of you guys did, and my apologies, on the uh, MBLY the other day, and I saw a, a world-famous trader was also in stock, and he also got clocked. So it kind of made me feel like great minds, and you never feel good about a loss, but it's like, okay, well, it looks like I was doing the right thing if he was doing that, and I was too. But this is where the real money is in capturing that longer-term trend, and I don't want to bring up any names because there's not enough to name drop lately, but we've had, had in the future a few that, that'll go up three and four hundred percent and we'll in one case i think five and six hundred percent where we've ridden them out for a long long time sometimes years and that's a little swing trade 
turns into these longer term trades. And that's where the money is. By the way, when somebody asks me a money management question, I know that's a trader that's either made it or he's very close to making it. It's like the beginners all want to know about methodology and setups. And then after they trade for a little while, then they want to know about psychology, which is vitally important. And that's something I beat to that horse on, obviously. And then it's like when they finally kind of get a little further down the line, and then they seem to worry more and more about the money management. All right, so let me try to answer this question. And again, if you could find that book, um, I forget who asked, oh, Brian. Brian, if you could find that book, uh, let me know or take a picture of the page and I can noodle with it a little bit more. So what he was saying is that you wait until you have QR, whatever that risk is, and then you bring your stop up to break even. Well, I can think of one advantage right away with this, and that would be if the stock imploded and then took off and you were able to get that QR out and then brought your stop up to break even. Unfortunately, even though looser stops equal more winners, like I said earlier, if you're a little newer to trading, trade at a smaller size, but trade at a wider stop size, and you're going to catch a few more trends, and that's going to make it worthwhile. And you know, you need those you need those wins. And there's a few people that have come into the service over the last six months or so, and they're like, I don't get it, you know, and, but you will eventually when we start catching some, some really good trends. But obviously, you're going to lose more when you're stopped out. Now, Without knowing all the details of his his methodology, and I see you, you've uh, you've got a comment coming in. Okay, Brian, keep them coming. Let me just finish this up, and then we'll see what you're saying. Uh, in theory of practice, I've got and I've probably given away nearly all of them, but I probably had a hundred books here. Uh, maybe not a hundred that said this, but I know I had at least a dozen that said things like uh, risk one x to make three x, and boy, that sounds great. So you win in a trade, that means that you could have three losing trades and still break even. It's like, well, the problem is the odds are three to one against you. You are three times more likely to get stopped out than hit your initial profit target. So getting back to what Brian was asking about, you're, there's a two to one that you're not going to make two to one. <laughs> If that makes sense, because he's only going to raise his stop once he gets to two to one. The one to one, even though the system developers think that it has a negative expectancy, what they can't factor in is how much that outlier is worth. And I know I make the outlier sound a little too elusive at times, but they come along just at the right time and you knock it out the park just at the right time. And that's the hard part about trend following. And, and I've done several pieces of this in presentations before, but I'd like to someday do a presentation on why trend following is so hard, but it's the only way to make money. And, and that's something I preach all the time. You have to capture a trend to make money. It's the only way to make money trading. And a lot of people have a hard time wrapping their head around it. And so it's like, well, you gotta, if you buy here, you have to sell here to make money, right? So why not be a trend follower all the time? So again, if you're doing like a 1x risk to 3x reward, the odds are three to one against you. All right, Brian says this. Actually, they brought the stop to break even at 1R, but did not take profits until 2R. Okay, I might have to noodle with that a little bit, but let me think off the top of my head. They brought the stop to break even at 1R, okay, but did not take profits until 2R. Well, in trading, there's always a trade-off. Now, did they take 100% profits at 2R or did they take half profits at 2R, okay? So what he's saying is they're going to bump their stop when they get to 1X, just like we do, except they're not going to take any profits. And then when they get to 2X, then they'll take profits. Well, it's just the same. You're going to make You're going to make more, you know, here's the thing too. And psychologically, this could be really difficult too. Let's say your 2X is right here. And let's say you're here and you get almost to right there and then you roll right back over. Now that does happen at 1X or 1R. Let's call it R, okay? It does happen at 1R. 
sometimes, okay, and that's why we use a little discretion sometimes to get out a little bit early, but it's it's twice as likely to happen. It's twice as likely not to ever get to the two R as it is to get to the one R. Okay, does that make sense? So the if you're looking for a two R move, that's gonna be that's gonna happen half as much as a one R move. And that's just statistics and noise alone. So yeah, let me noodle with that. They brought the stop to break even at one R, but did not take profits of two R. Yeah, I think I've I've probably fleshed it out. Let's say I think they were taking all profits at two or three R, depending on how they plan the trade. Yeah, that's a problem. I think that the only way to make money management work is that you have to position yourself for unlimited gains. So you're gonna have to keep your losses relatively in check. You're gonna have to limit your losses. Now, you limit your losses two ways. One, you only put up a small percentage of your account. Two, you become super selective. I've been super selective and I've still gotten burnt on, on quite a few stocks, even by being few, too selective or, or very selective. I said too selective because somebody told me they thought I was too selective, but then we ended up with a couple of winners and it's uh, a couple of losers. It's like, well, you know what? Maybe I'm not selective enough. You know, I've been just waiting and waiting and waiting, and it's, it's been really grinding you down. But the big winners are just around the corner. And, and I know I keep saying that, but we're getting there. We're getting closer and closer each day. But again, two ways to limit your losses. One, actually limit them, which you have to do. Risk a small percentage of your account. 2% if stopped out is the maximum. Work up to that amount. And again, the money, as I'm doing this, I'm thinking of all the stuff that's in the money management module. There's a lot of stuff in there. So go in and watch it if you can't sleep at night. But it's good stuff. And, and like I said, once you become start becoming an actual successful and profitable trader, you become more and more obsessed with the money management and, of course, the psychology, too. But you want to have relatively limited losses, garbage in, garbage out, and limit the amount you're trading, okay? And then you have to have the potential for unlimited gains. Because every now and then you're gonna get whacked for more than you intended. That's one of the few things that I can guarantee in this business. So you're going to have to position yourself for the occasional home run to pay for it all, okay? Now, if you do just the opposite, that is a recipe for disaster. People ask me how accurate I am. My accurate can, accuracy, my accurate, my accuracy can often be abysmal, but that doesn't bother me. Now, true, after a few losses, I'm ready for a win, like anybody would be. But I know that that occasional win is going to make it all worthwhile, and I'm not so worried about being inaccurate. Now, I am worried about picking the best and leaving the rest when it comes to the setups. But once I do that, let's just see how it works out, provided we get an entry, right? And follow the money management. And if you get stopped out, you get stopped out. You have to learn to live with your decision. As long as I'm doing all those things, I know that eventually, especially if I'm super selective when conditions are less than ideal, like now and like they have been for months, then I'm going to catch those occasional winners. Now, if you do just the opposite, well, before, before we get to that, just real quick, when I did a lot of mechanical testing back in the day, I discovered, and the numbers are somewhere around here, but I'm sure they're fairly accurate, you're gonna be wrong, just round numbers, about 70% of the time is a pure trend follower, okay? Like if you're doing something like the turtles or whatever, you, you're gonna be wrong about 70% of the time, and you're only gonna catch a good trend about 30% of the time. So it is, it does have this negative aspect to it. And by the way, when you lose money emotionally, it's twice a neurological impact. Some people say 2.5, I've seen 10, but I'd say it's probably between two and three or whatever, but it has two or three times the emotional impact as when you make a gain. And that's what causes gamblers ruin. They keep trying to get back, get back, get back. And as they get further in the hole, both monetarily and mentally, it becomes tougher and tougher. Now, I forget, uh, I think it was Eckhart, Eckhart, or it might have been, I'm trying to think of the guy's name, I could see his face, Druckenmiller. One of those guys, and I have all the quotes here, I'll have to find it for next week. 
But one of them said that what makes you feel good, and I'm pretty sure it was Eckert, what makes you feel good in the markets fails miserably longer term. And what he's talking about is, let's say somebody tells you they have a 90% correct system. Well, what they're doing is they're eating like a bird and shitting like an elephant. So they're saying, okay, we're going to take a, a half a point profit, but we're going to risk five points for that half a point. So you're going to you get 90% of the time, you're going to get that half a point, but every now and then you get it whack for five points, okay? And that's the, that's the really hard thing. That's like selling options or reversion to the mean trading. And as I've said before, I get more pure reversion to the mean type traders than any other type of methodology that come to me for the trend following. But anyway, recipe for disaster. And, you know, I've seen that stuff work, and I've got some two drink minimum stories here, but I've seen that stuff work for a long, long time before blowing up, but eventually it's gonna blow up. It's like playing Russian roulette with a gun with maybe a hundred chambers or maybe even 200 chambers, but there's still a bullet in there, okay? And it still has your name on it. Anyway, I hope I didn't get too morbid with that. All right, any questions or anything on that? Yeah, Brian, if you could find the book, I don't think you were in the group when I gave away all my books. I wonder if it's one of the books I gave away. In fact, that yeah, it was on the top shelf. Yeah, I, that's one of my unloaded. It just wasn't valuable to me. I didn't. I I could. I wasn't getting anything out of it. When in my old house, I had a a guest house, like a thousand square feet or so, and I have no idea what this office is. Not a thousand square feet. <laughs> much smaller i thought it'd be easy to live with a smaller office but boy it's hard to down it's hard to go down all right let's take a look at crypto real quick and then we'll hop into the stock market so let's see if we could do this i don't know what time these change over i see a few are waking up sometimes as i said you could just pick the the ones that are strongest but right now it's not that type of market and that one caught my eye earlier but it's a little too crazy even by my standards, but if you got something that's been trending for a while and up in clear air, like this one here, for instance, if a lot of other ones, maybe back here would have been better, obviously, but if a lot of pairs are, are really taken off, sometimes you just buy the ones that are going straight up. And what I do with those is, and this one's got a few long tails, so this wouldn't be a perfect example, but let's say we are playing that relative strength game. If, it, if it's at the top of the candle, sometimes, okay, 12 GMT. And can you change that, Jeff? Do you know this is Trading View for this? So Trading View is the best uh, crypto. That's the only reason I have Trading View. Stock charts has quite a few, but uh, right now Trading View has the has has the most crypto that I've seen. But anyway, you can sometimes buy the ones that are going straight up into brand new air, and then put in like a 20% profit target. Okay, thank you, Jeff. All right, so that's that's been a mystery for me for a long time. When do these things roll over? So it rolls over at 12 GMT. So I'm at uh, some six hours behind GMT, I believe. But that makes sense. A roll somewhere around six or seven o'clock my time. Anyway, again, sometimes you can just buy the strongest ones, and that's all you do. And then anything less than a rip roaring bull market, as I showed this week and last week. Just buy the ones that are like pulling back, like the C Web pull back in here. I bought this pull back and knock on wood. So far, so good. It's getting a little bumpy in here, but there's no need to sell it just yet. Let's take a look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin is just having a hard time getting going. Every time I hear someone talk about Bitcoin, especially like on the news or whatever, not that I listen to that much news, but it makes me think that if Bitcoin was a true supply, I think it would be 10 times higher than it is now. I did an article a while back on Bitcoin and the supply of 21 million max is enough for everyone in Florida to have one or everybody in California, every other person in California to have one, okay? So that's the entire supply for the planet, the universe, I guess. <laughs> so there's a lot of paper Bitcoin out there. And 
you know, all these brokerages that go under, it makes you wonder, are they, uh, like in Livermore sense, I've been talking a lot about him in the Trading Simplified shows, but are they bucketing the orders, okay? So what's the old saying with the, with the crypto? Not your keys, not your coins. So unless you've got a hardware wallet and you have your your crypto keys in your hand, then you don't actually own the Bitcoin. Somebody else owns the Bitcoin or whatever the crypto it may be. So that C-Web I have, by the way, you guys know what these guys do? I have no idea. <laughs> but I like them. I like it when it goes up. But if you don't have those keys, not your keys, not your coins. So if I bought some Bitcoin right now on this exchange, whatever exchange this is, KuCoin, then the KuCoin would own my Bitcoin, right? I'd have a right to it. And as long as the broker stays in business, I have a right to it. But do I actually have that actual Bitcoin? And I think there's been some runs before on Bitcoins, which have caused some some interesting things. And I never got around to it, but Someday I might write a story on a, a, an article on a paper Bitcoin. There's got to be a lot of it out there. It's like gold. I mean, think about gold. I have a pretty small backyard now. I came off of six acres. I'm in the city now. But it's probably big enough to, to fit all the gold in the world, as little as my backyard is. All the gold in the world. Somebody said Olympic-sized swimming pool. In one of these presentations, uh, that's viable. That's probably about right. So it's not a whole lot of gold in the entire world when you think about it. Now, as many people who trade gold, there's not enough gold to go around. There's not that much real gold out there with all the derivatives and everything else. So I think Bitcoin has become a victim of that really, really fast. So you really can't confuse the issue with facts. If there was only 21 million, I think it would easily be 10 times, maybe even 20 or 100 times higher than it is. But for some reason, probably because all that paper Bitcoin floating around in derivatives, it's not. So you can't buy it just because of a of a theory, because all that supply somehow is out there. All right, let's shift gears. Let's get into stocks. You guys want to ask about individual stock stocks, feel free to do so. Okay, let's take a look at the P's. Obviously, we got whacked a little today off the worst levels. Did find a little support. You can see the moving averages have turned down. The 10 is turned down. 10's a simple, okay? These are the bow tie moving averages. 20's an exponential, as Greg Morris taught me. As soon as the market crosses below the exponential moving average, it will turn down, which I thought was pretty cool. In this case, the... The 10 caught up with it too, but you, if you go in and look, there's times when, like right here, you see we closed below the 10, but the 10 didn't turn down, okay? Because it's 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 dropping off and adding in, it's actually still going up, even though the market started going down. But an exponential moving average, as soon as it crosses below, like right there, if you zoom way in, and certainly you could see it right here, a little bit maybe, if you zoom way in, the Exponential average will turn down. So that's kind of cool. It's just mathematics. And look, you see this little blip here? Okay, you can see right there, close below both of them, and they both turned down. Guess what? Close above it, they both turned up. I know I'm a nerd, but that's kind of cool. <laughs> and by accident, I found the relationship between the 10 simple and the 20 and 30. You make Sometimes it makes these beautiful little bow ties, and that can be especially useful when the market's coming off all-time highs, like way back here or if it's coming off of major, major, major lows. Okay. Let's take a look at bonds since we're down here. Bonds are kind of all over the place. That would be the high of the range, obviously. Down here would be the bottom, shorter term range right here. At least they're not way down here anymore, but I sure would like to see them break out and not look back for a while. The dollar's kind of all over the place, and now it's generally weak. I wouldn't rush out and buy or sell it at this point in time. Let's take a look at like a weekly chart. On well, a weekly chart, you can see it still looks pretty ugly. Bow ties are in downtrend, proper order. Let's take a look at the quack. I hadn't called it that in a while. 
Notice you have multiple peaks right here and a little further back. We just got thwarted at those. Same thing happened at a piece. So I know I shouldn't say hope, but hopefully we'll take those out with a little bit of vigor after a little bit of faking out in here. We did close below the, uh, okay, Rick, we'll get to those. We did close below 30 EMA. Nothing magical about that. One or two big updates at these levels would fix this problem, but obviously that has to happen. The Russell 2000, as I've been saying, a nausea kind of looks like a complex head and shoulders bottom, which means you have multiple heads and multiple shoulders and maybe a head and shoulders within a head and shoulders, right? You got a head and shoulders here. I'm just kind of noticing within this bigger picture, head and shoulders. So just because it's bottoming doesn't mean we want to rush out and buy it. The bottom could take a long time. It might come down here and retest its lows before it's finished doing its thing. So Russell has been a bit of a bummer in here. Gold commodity is right at or almost at all-time highs, at least vis-a-vis -vis the, the GLD. I don't know where we are historically. I'll have to look at a spot gold chart. If somebody does, let me know off the top of the head. I didn't think to look at spot before I went live. Energy is a bit of a bummer. You can see you're getting ready to bow tie to the downside or have bow tie to the downside. They failed to get out of this range and now they're breaking down out of the range again. So maybe we'll start seeing some shorts setting up here fairly soon. Now, gold's doing really well and silver's doing really well. We'll take a look at that in just one second, the silver that is. But metals and mining have kind of rolled back over again. We've got downtrend proper order in the bow ties. And then we also have falling tops. Now, again, a few big updates would change that, but obviously that has to happen. Foods are right at these all-time highs, which is interesting, but there's not a whole lot to get excited about in the foods. The HV there could be really low. Things were a bit of a bummer because I wanted to short the snot out of them, but they just sort of chopping and chopping and chopping, going higher and higher and higher and higher and higher, and then they finally rolled over. So that's a bit of a bummer. But the bank's not looking so hot, obviously, in here. Financials are getting dragged down a little, too. As you can see, gap lower today, a little follow through the downside. Bow ties, you guessed it, downtrend, proper order, or close to it. Insurance and other financials are getting whacked with it, too. Insurance, a bit of a bummer. Almost made it to all-time highs. And then look at that. Nope, got thwarted right there. Drugs have been doing pretty good. They're kind of hanging in here. Any additional weakness would be concerning because it would put us down below this recent peak in here, but so far, so good, hanging in there. Biotech in general seems to be improving. It's a little wide and loose and all over the place, but as you can see, bow ties in uptrend proper order, couple of days of Landry light above the 30 EMA and the 20 EMA, not too far from these uh, recent peaks in here, but you know routine, one day at a time. Just curious, your meta stock bow tie template uses candlesticks, which preference. I I like using candles on my intraday stuff. Spot goal is 2050. Where is that historically, Jeff? Is that uh I don't always keep those levels in my head. Certain markets like the peas, I usually know where they are. So something like gold, I'm not so sure. Uh what were we just talking about? Golds. I uh, lost my train of thought. Anyway, health services have been doing pretty good. Came back in, as you can see, in here. Some areas like defense were doing okay, trying to break out the new highs, but then they rolled back over. So it's like we got this rolling correction happening, and not enough stuff is getting traction to get this market firing on all eight cylinders. Okay, yeah, candles versus bar. Yeah, I tried to multi-process. And Literally, you can only do one thing at a time. That's the way your brain works. And 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 I'm with my ADD, you know, I've got to be really careful. Uh, what are we talking about? <laughs> Squirrel. Um, the candles is just a default in Metastock. That doesn't necessarily mean that I, I told them to put candles. They just figured that everybody likes candles. In, in my intraday stuff and on my screens over here, where, where I'm looking at them intraday, even for my position trading intraday, for the most part, I use candles, but I actually, especially for like a, a intraday stuff, I use candles, but I don't have them paint the, 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 the real body, okay? So I never know at quick glance 
whether the market went up or down on the last candle. And I find that it's kind of like be as close to the market as you need to be, but no closer. So if I'm looking at a 30 minute bar chart that doesn't have a shaded candle, I have to look really well to see where the price is. So let's say I get long a market and it starts building these blocks on top of where I get in. And I look at it and I can see the real body stacking up. Okay. Then I know I'm in a pretty good market and I just need to sit on my hands and let it unfold. If I were watching the colored candles, I'd see a black candle or a red candle, whatever color it may be, in the middle of that trend. When there were, even though the real bodies are stacking up, I would be like, "Aha! It's it's beginning to implode, and it's uh, three birds crapping on a wire, or a fat sumo wrestler sitting on a little baby's head, or I don't know some other kind of silly candle pattern." And I might get sucked into that. But instead, I, I just use the candles just because they're easy to recognize. I can look at them from across the office. And a lot of times, I don't even worry whether or not it's on the top or the bottom of the candle. I try not to worry, at least. One-year goal is about 10%, five-year goal, 60%. Yeah, now gold, like any other asset, all these guys in the radio, they finally start to look like geniuses. <laughs> You know, like Larry Williams says, they sure do want your dollars bad, though, and they're, they're, they're really ramping up their ads. Because gold finally did begin to move, but gold can be dead for a long time. And gold, like any other asset class, including stocks and real estates and whatever else you want to call an asset, Bitcoin, will lose half of its value at some point in your lifetime. And we'll use probably could say that it will lose half its value at multiple points in your lifetime because it has. Yeah, Brian, whatever you used to, I just like, um, I started noodling with candles like everybody else in the mid nineties when all the books were just coming out. Uh, was it Nissen and uh, Greg Morris wrote a few books on candles. Greg went to Japan to study candles. Got some interesting stories from that. Um, and the only reason I switched back was I started working with someone who was old school and wouldn't bother looking at candles at all. And he was looking at bar charts and he taught me how to read charts with bar charts. So that's why I switched back to the bar charts. But I do like them for certain purposes, like seeing them across the office and you know, my eyes are getting a little bad, a little worse. I'll be able to see the charts a little better, something intraday at least. The fence, a bit of a bummer, you know, look at that, all-time highs, and then it rolls back over and bow ties to the downside. So that's kind of ugly. Maybe we'll see some shorts there soon. I've been, I've been trying not to short, but if this market weakens much more, I might have to. M&C's been doing really well, just, just shy of all-time highs in here, but it's been a pretty good trend as of late. One of the few good-looking good looking trending areas, that and drugs. Leisure's beginning to stall out a little bit at the prior peak, and if you back the chart way out, and remember, markets have long memories, okay? You've got a mountain of overhead resistance way back here. I guess that's pre-pandemic, right? What else? Transport's all over the place, just kind of sideways, nothing to glean there. If I could find them, there they are. Just kind of wide and loose and all over the place, so not much excitement there. Software had been doing pretty good, losing a little steam in here, as you can see. One or two big updates would make a big difference, but obviously that has to happen. Semiconductor is one of my favorite areas to watch. Is a bit of a bummer, which bums me out. Bow tie to the downside, beginning to roll back over. It's not that far away from the moving averages and prior peaks, so I hate to use the word hope, but let's hope we get one or two big updates to negate all this negativity that seems to be happening. And finally, let's take a look at silver real quick. Silver, you can see, bam, winning right at these brand new highs in here. Not all-time highs for the for the the SLV at least, but looking pretty good, and closing at these multi-year highs. So silver definitely looking pretty good. All right, let's open up for individual stocks. Crocs for Rick. Crocs. Um, I'm guessing you want to short that. Yeah, I prefer shorting something off of all-time highs, but it's it's it pretty good. It's pretty close to those all-time highs. Or, or high enough, I'd say, for a short. Oh, you're talking about not shorting it. No, okay. Um, well, you got a gap down, okay? I'm, I think I might start working, and actually, I, I was going to start working on it today, and I actually found 
we actually started working on it, on it previously. But I, a lot of times, like in the Facebook group, I'll see, and especially now since there hasn't been a lot of great setups lately, it's like everybody's trying to make something happen. And I'll notice that the uh, the some of the stock picking is is a little bit less than stellar. I'm not picking on anybody. It's just the the, the market itself. So you want to look for like trend qualifiers. Okay. So you, if you look at the buy this market, you got a big fat gap against the trend. This thing kind of imploded. This looks like a stock that's in a lot of trouble. So I would, I would avoid, I would avoid going long that if anything on a bounce, it could set up on a short side. Okay. Let's take a look at tech TCK. Um, yeah, this one's a little wide and loose. Notice you got a, you got a big old gap. So whenever you look at a trend, okay. Now it did kind of work its way off the lows, but most of this trend is right here. And then the majority of that trend was was in this one big pop from there to there, okay? And then it did continue higher, but then it retraced quite a bit. And then you got a gap down here. And then it barely just got past this prior peak. And then it barely just got past this prior peak. So it's kind of all over the place. So I would have a hard time getting excited about that. Now I'm not beating you up. Because I'm having a hard time getting excited about anything in this market. And I guess you could show it. But the only good looking stock off the top of my head, all kidding aside, I like Riot. We're long Riot. But uh, SYM, which we got long today, looks pretty good. I mean, it's one of the few really good looking stocks out there. Let's see if we can get rid of the bow ties real quick. But take a look at this, okay? You've got kind of a gradual trend here. And then you accelerate out of it. You've got a lot of persistency. It's not it's not perfect, 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 textbook perfect, but it's a good looking stock, okay? So show me acceleration, show me persistency, show me a pullback that's deep enough, show me a stock that's that's in clear air and doesn't have any overhead supply. And then, you know, I'll make a list of all these things as time allows. And I think, even though it took me 14 hours to go through the stock selection course to, to complete it or to film it or whatever, uh, it probably took me two, three, four weeks of filming. But anyway, it was 14 hours of tape. I think 90% of that can probably be explained in, in like one sheet, like a cheat sheet. So I need to work on that cheat sheet. But everything I just said is going to go in that cheat sheet, I can promise. And, it, and look on Facebook, look at some of the stock picks. And again, not to pick on anybody, but look at some of the stock picks, and it's like, okay, what's the HV? Okay, yeah, it's a good-looking stock, but the HV is 17 or 20 or pretty low or something. Look at the overhead supply. You, know, you back the chart out just another month or two, and you got a big old wad of overhead supply. So that's just two things right there. You've got gaps against the trend on some of these setups and all those other little things. So I think that, again, 90% of it could be condensed into one piece of paper, and you just need the other 13 and a half hours. <laughs> to learn the nuances. All right, any more individual issues you guys want to take a look at? I think I got spot gold in here. No, it's not in. Okay, going once, going twice. Well, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending again tonight. Thank you so much. Looks like we broke a new record uh, compared to lately, so thank you. Anything unanswered, DavidAvelander.com. If you're in Facebook, bring it up there. And if you're watching this on YouTube, drop a comment below. I appreciate it. And I read all comments and I answer when there's one worth, when it uh, requires an answer, not worth answering, requires an answer. So thanks, everybody, again, and may the trend be with you. Thank you so much.